Hello everybody, uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, I'm continuing today in the study of the book of John. Uh, now if you have not seen all the previous videos on John, I urge you to go back and watch it from the beginning. Uh, I believe this is the most important book in the entire Bible. But today I'm going to pick up where I left off. Uh, so I'll start with chapter 16, verse 1. Now, I'm what uh, Brother Joe calls um, a KJV firstist, which means that I like to read it first in the KJV, and most of the time uh, that's good enough. I, I can understand it. But sometimes I like to also look at it in the Amplified Translation because the Amplified, uh, sometimes that's helpful to me, uh, and it's kind of like adding a translation and a commentary into one translation. So, uh, let's begin uh, John chapter 16, verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. Wow. Well, uh, as I'm reading this, I'm seeing that uh, almost the entire chapter 16 is printed in red letters. Now, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with the idea of red letters, um, but. There are many uh, Bible publishers that have uh, taken what they believe to be the actual spoken words of Jesus, and rather than printing them in black, as the rest of the text is, uh, they use red ink. And these red letters are uh, believed to be the actual words of Jesus. And I don't think I've found any, any reason to believe in all my studies that uh, they've ever uh, taken uh, the red letters and applied it to non-words of Jesus. Uh, so I think it's pretty trustworthy to consider that the red letters are the spoken words of Jesus. Um, now, so the this whole chapter in, almost entirely is red letters. Uh, I'm going to read these first two verses in the Amplified. It says, I have told you these things so that you will not stumble or be caught off guard and fall away. They will put you out of the synagogues and make you outcasts. And time is coming when whoever kills you will think that he is offering service to God. Well, let me turn this fan off and see if I can't live without it. <clears throat> well, it didn't take the world long to start killing uh, those people who believed in Jesus. Um, from the, 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 the apostles, uh, disciples, all through the first century and second, third, fourth, all through all, all of history and, and still today in the, the 21st century, we see that those people who proclaim their faith in Jesus, that uh, they uh, suffer persecution. Uh, sometimes it's just hatred. Sometimes it's uh, more. It's imprisonment, torture, and even death. All of the uh, 11 remaining apostles, after Judas killed himself, the 11 remaining apostles, uh, 10 of the 11, suffered martyrs deaths and uh, it probably would be worth your while to study the uh, the fate of all these apostles and uh, they were killed in a variety of ways most of them suffered horrible uh, executions because they dared believe in and proclaim that uh, jesus is our savior god so um jesus tells them here and he's told them numerous times 
that uh, this is what they have to look forward to, uh, suffering, persecution, and martyrdom. And the interesting thing I find in this portion is that it says that, and they will do, uh, and a time is coming when whoever kills you will think that he is offering service to God. Now, I, I don't know if you're very familiar with uh, the, the martyrs of the church. When I say church, I'm talking about the uh, the, um, uh, the the totality of all those who have ever put their faith in Jesus as Savior. Uh, I'm not talking about the Roman Catholic cult. Uh, I'm not talking about even various sects of, of um, uh, Protestant denominations around the world today. Uh, I'm not talking about membership, putting your name on the log or getting some formal membership in your local church. Uh, the church in the Bible just means uh, the totality of all those who believe Jesus is their Savior God. Uh, but the uh, throughout history, these people have, have suffered martyrdom. And there's a book that I will recommend. I do think that every believer should read this book. Uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Um, there's modern uh, books uh, like this that are, are more current. Um, I think there's, uh, they're titled uh, Jesus Freaks and Jesus Freaks Part 2. I read Jesus Freaks 1 and also Fox's Book of Martyrs, but what these books attempt to do is give us a graphic historical account of the suffering and uh, deaths of, of Christians throughout history. So, uh, and, and many of these people, I, I, I would suppose that probably 60, 70, 80%, maybe 90% of them, those people who tortured and murdered them, they believed that they were doing God a favor. They thought they were doing the will of God to kill all those who believe in Jesus. So this statement by Jesus is prophetic and it certainly has come true. If you do choose to read this book, Fox's Book of Martyrs, I caution you, it's not an enjoyable book. You won't find any pleasure in it. It may turn your stomach and make you sick because of the, the graphic details. When you, but that I think we owe it to those who suffered in such horrible ways. We owe it to them out of respect for their suffering and their faithfulness uh, to read this these accounts. Now back to King James uh, verse th uh, 3. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. So the Bible is full of prophecies. And uh, I have a, a, a playlist and videos I've made and uh, collected uh, on biblical prophecies and their fulfillment. And these prophecies serve uh, as, as proof to us that the, the Bible is just not a, a, a history book. It, it's, it is history. It's his story. It's the story about our creator God and Savior, Jesus. But it's also the history of the world. And uh, from the beginning of creation, uh, the, of the universe, the earth, and time, and even and man and all all living things on earth and then it goes into individuals histories and history of nations uh, but it, it is more than just a history book there's you could go to any bookstore and or library and find a lot of books that are history books 
But even though it is a true historical account, uh, it, it is the word of God. This is inspired. This, these are the words and accounts that God wants us to know. So this is God speaking to us through the prophets and the written word so that we can learn the truth. Um, but the purpose of these prophecies are to, uh, it, it's sign and proof that uh, this is inspired because there are so many clear, specific, detailed prophecies where the Bible tells us something's going to go to happen, going to happen in the future, and it's in in, in great uh, detailed account, <clears throat> and in the, and then it's fulfilled years, decades, centuries later. It's fulfilled exactly as it was written. This is one of the great proofs that the Bible is the Word of God, and that we can trust it, and we should use it as our test of truth, test of theological truth. Um, so he says, but these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. Um, and these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. So he's, he's saying that what I'm with you in the flesh uh, during my time of ministry to you and as you're uh, with me as my disciples. Uh, uh, I uh, There's some things I told you, some things I didn't tell you. I gradually revealed more about the future. I think perhaps he didn't want to scare them away too soon because he told them about, you know, their future would be horrible, uh, their suffering and death. Uh, so you have to, you can't just, the very first time you meet someone, tell them about that and expect them to be enticed and and want to follow you. Uh, <clears throat> Verse 5. <clears throat> Let me read this 3 and 4 in the Amplified. It says, <clears throat> And they will do these things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you these things now so that when the t their time comes, you will remember that I told you about them. I did not say these things to you at the beginning because I was with you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Back to the KJV, verse 5. But now I go my way to him that sent me. He's going to the Father. And none of you asketh me, whither goest thou? Be, but because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So, uh, in before Jesus' incarnation, we have numerous accounts of what are called uh, theophanies, Christophanies. And some people argue about a certain account, was, was that a theophany or a Christophany? Uh, theophany is simply uh, when God uh, appeared among men. Uh, and he, for example, in the garden, walked with them. And um, or let's say it, in the time of Abraham, how uh, three men came to Abraham. Two of them we find out are angels later, and then we we have to conclude that the the, the third of them is actually God appearing to Abraham, and uh, but it's, he appears as a man. So when when God appears to mankind as a man, uh, it's a theophany. And if you believe that this appearance is actually a pre-incarnation appearance of Jesus, then we would call it a Christophany, uh, Christ appearing 
as a man to mankind before his you know birth and uh, and life <clears throat> so uh, so the point I'm making is that uh, in the back history before the incarnation of Jesus you have uh, God appearing to man interacting with man from time to time and uh, uh, and then whether that was God the Father or whether it was Jesus Christ appearing you know we can study and debate but then you have the birth of Jesus where God was manifest in the flesh Jesus says that he's eternal God Almighty and he came down from heaven and he became flesh and dwelled among us. So from that point, we have this 33 year period where God lived uh, as a man. He, Jesus, fully God, fully man, living among uh, us for 33 years. Uh, and then his death, burial, resurrection, uh, 40 days with uh, showing himself and that he, there was a bodily resurrection and then an ascension and the scripture says and now he sits at the right hand of the father uh, in heaven but now the presence that the world has is not the father or the son but we have the Holy Spirit the third person of the Godhead Jesus says, this Holy Spirit, who he calls the Comforter, when Jesus leaves, the Comforter will come. The Comforter won't come unless until he leaves. So it's, it's necessary for him to go away for the, in order for the Comforter to come. Now, throughout the Bible history and all these accounts, you find that many times it says that the various prophets were filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, even during the time of Jesus' ministry, sometimes he would uh, say, breathe on the, the apostles, and it says that they would be filled with the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit is a temporary uh, thing where the Holy Spirit lives in the prophet uh, to, in order to uh, do some, uh, some work, perform some kind of miracle. Uh, or ministry work, uh, but there was no uh, indwelling and sealing of the Holy Spirit. Uh, where in the past, this Holy Spirit would come into the prophet temporarily and then leave. It wasn't permanent. But now, ever since Pentecost, the beginning of the church, all of us who put our faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into us and remains in us. When he first enters us, is the baptism of the Spirit. As he continues living, is it's called the indwelling of the Spirit. And the fact that he will never leave us is called the sealing of the Holy Spirit, where he's sealed. And no other spirit can get in, and the Holy Spirit cannot get out. It's, it's a permanent um, relationship. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Um, so the point is that he's saying that you know, the Holy Spirit will come after he goes. And now we've got uh, verse 8. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. All right, I'm, I'm going to read those verses in the Amplified and see if it's, uh, uh, it's even more clear. So starting with verse 8, and he, that's the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world about the guilt of sin and the need for a savior. See, unless we understand that we're sinners, we're guilty and we're lost and, 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 and condemned, we won't understand the need for a pardon, for a, for a, a savior. To, we won't 
feel we need to be rescued by God unless we understand that we're in trouble. Um, but if I go, oops, no. and about righteousness and about judgment, about sin and the true nature of it, because they do not believe in me and my message. Well, the, the, the sins that, that all of mankind has done, which we could, uh, we could specify, um, and, and, but we could also just generalize about what sin is. We know specifically some examples of sin are lying, cheating, stealing, uh, uh, killing, um, f f um, fornication, adultery. There, there's many things that are specified as sin. Cigarette smoking. Uh, I, I don't smoke cigarettes, but I'm just using this as an illustration. And I'm not trying to justify my cigarette smoking because I don't smoke. But cigarette smoking uh, is not stated explicitly in the Bible that smoking cigarettes is a sin. If it does say stealing is a sin. Um, now we could try to um, ask ourselves, well, what about cigarette smoking? It could, could we, would, can we somehow determine if that's sinful or not? Well, we can attempt to make that decision. There's verses that seem to indicate that, uh, uh, you know, if we're doing something harmful to our body, which is the temple of God, uh, perhaps that's uh, sinful. But the, the point I'm making is that sin uh, is spelled out clearly. Some things that are uh, distinctly, they're unmistakably stated as sin, and other things it's more vague and more uh, ambiguous. Uh, but I would I would say sin are the things that uh, God is saying. Uh, I, I don't want you to do that, and God has His reasons. God doesn't say I don't want you to have. Um, sex with a lot of different people throughout your life and be promiscuous and in fornication having sex outside of a marriage uh, he, he doesn't say i don't want you to do that because he's a party pooper because he gives you this desire for sex and makes sex very um, uh, pleasurable and yet then yet says uh, even though i made uh, you a strong desire and it's such you have so much fun doing sex I don't want you to do it because I, so I just want you to be frustrated. Now, God, God does not tell us uh, uh, to do certain things and to not do other things because He's trying to uh, spoil our fun. He He tells us to do things and to not do things because in God's judgment, which is the the, the truth, He knows what's good and bad for us, and He knows that if we have sex. Uh, promiscuously outside of a marriage that there are uh, consequences, natural consequences that, that come from that kind of behavior. Sexually transmitted diseases, uh, um, out of wedlock uh, uh, births, um, and maybe and, and if there's adultery, maybe it causes divorces, uh, and death in some cases. There's all kinds of consequences. So in God's wisdom, he tells us, don't do that. I know what's best for you, so I'm telling you, don't do that kind of behavior. <clears throat> and it's wise for us to listen to him. But when we when we do the contrary of what God wants us to do, uh, we, we can say that is sin. Um, but there are people today that <clears throat> they, they, <clears throat> they believe that they are uh, not sinning and that they want to impose this on you, saying, you better not sin anymore. If you want to be a Christian, you can't sin anymore. And like me, they say, like me, I, I don't sin anymore. But when they make that kind of a claim, what they do is they water down what sin is. <clears throat> there are only way you can person can pretend or delude themselves that they no longer sin is to water down the definition of what sin is. <clears throat> so they could say that, uh, well, I haven't stolen anything. The Bible says, thou shalt not steal. So I haven't stolen anything for 40 years since I've been a Christian. But it's not just actually taking someone's property. 
it's being jealous or envious or coveting and desiring what they have. Uh, you know, so sin is not just doing a bad act. It's even thinking about it, even, even having, not just committing adultery, but having lustful thoughts. So you have sins that you, of action, you, you act it out, you commit a sin, and then there's also uh, sinful thoughts. And Jesus made it clear that uh, even sinful thoughts are, are, are serious, and he considers it sin. sin. Uh, and then there's also sins of omission, where the Bible tells us that if you fail to do something good, if you have an opportunity to do something good, like that homeless person that needs help, and you you fail to help them, you turn your back on them, and that's a, a sin of uh, omission. You neglected to do something good when you had the opportunity. <clears throat> so when we look at sin in that way, no one can escape the guilt, guilty verdict. Um, but the sin that's referenced here in, in verse 8, he will reprove the world of sin. Um, uh, we have the law, what Paul says, is, is there to, as a schoolmaster to teach us that we're sinners and guilty and we're in need of a Savior. <clears throat> but the sin that all those sins were paid for, Jesus died and paid for uh, every sin I've ever done, every sin you've ever done, every sin that we may do in the future, because at the time of Jesus' death on the cross, all of our sins were future sins. So it's, it's uh, the sins of the whole world are paid for, the Bible says, and not just those uh, sins of those who believe in Jesus, but even the people who don't believe in Jesus, Jesus paid for their sins too. <clears throat> so <clears throat> there is one sin problem that needs to be resolved, and that's the sin of unbelief. And the one thing that is unforgivable is for you to reject this free gift of salvation that Jesus offers you. When you refuse to believe in Jesus and trust him and depend on him, uh, that's the sin, I think, that has been referenced here. And it says, uh, and, he, and he, when he comes, will convict the world about the guilt of sin and the need for a savior, and about righteousness, and about judgment, about sin and the true nature of it, because they do not believe in me and my message. So it says, the sin that's referenced here is the fact that they do not believe in him, in his message. Uh, believing in him and his message means you believe he is God, that he became a man, that he died for our sins, that he was raised from the dead, and that faith in him is, is, is required for everyone to receive the gift of eternal life. If you refuse to believe that, that's the sin, that uh, you, you need to be convicted of that sin. You need to feel guilty and understand, wait a second, I do need Jesus. Um, let's go to uh, verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, uh, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Things to come, these are prophecies. So the prophecies uh, are, are revealed through the Holy Spirit. He shall glorify me. The Holy Spirit will glorify and testify about Jesus, uh, giving all the glory to Jesus. And we, too, must give all the glory to Jesus. All credit belongs to Jesus. We should never be able to go to God and say, I want some of the credit because of the good things I did. I deserve heaven. We need to say, no, nothing I've done merits heaven. What, what I'm relying on is what Jesus has done for me. And that way, Jesus retains all the glory. <clears throat> Verse 14, He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. <clears throat> I think this is about the midway point, when you see that verse. 
15. Um, I'm going to end this video here because my voice is getting a little hoarse. <coughs> I don't want to continue talking. And I'll pick up with verse 16 in the next study. So this is John chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. <clears throat> and I think you understand now who Jesus is, what he's done for you, and your need for him. So I, I hope you will today put your faith in Jesus. Uh, reject the idea that, that you could go before God and say, I deserve heaven because I was religious, I did good things. Reject that because the Bible says it's impossible to get to heaven through our own righteousness. So reject that and instead boast in Jesus, boast in what he's done for you and who he is and your reliance on him. Okay, thank you for watching and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.